There are some black women who will call me a misogynist based on what they have read on my blog, www.shawnsjames.blogspot.com. After reading several of my older articles, such as why 70% of black women are single and why black women will be single for the rest of their lives, they would say this about me. However, if they were to look at the catalog of books that I have produced, you would see a different story. In this book, recently published in 2013, The Thetas, this isn't a sorority story about African-American women. It is one of my better-selling titles, and it presents a fair and balanced image of black women. And this book right here, All About Maryland, published in 2009, when I first started the SJS Direct imprint, was about the struggles of an African-American actress in Hollywood. It is a critically, um, it's one of my most popular books. It's critically acclaimed, and many women, both black, white, and white, have praised it for presenting one of the most balanced and positive portrayals of African-American women. One second. This book, All About Nikki, the fabulous first season, is, a, is, a, is another book that was praised and critically acclaimed by both African-American women, white women, and even white even women all over the world. This also presents a fair and balanced image of black women. This was a concept I just based it on, which is based on All About Marilyn, presents a positive sitcom image of an African-American teenager, considered to be one of the most balanced images of African-American teenagers you know, out there, and I've had actresses actually ask me if this would be possible to produce this and make this into an actual television show. One second. This book, Isis, which I published in 2002, it features an African-American fantasy heroine. It's one of the few books that features an African-American fantasy heroine in a solo adventure. And over the last couple of years, I have turned this fan this Isis, this character Isis, into a fantasy series. Um, and that series features um, books such as Isis, All About the Goddess, um, Isis, Wrath of the Cyber Goddess, here, Isis, Power of the Princess, um, the most recent Isis, Night of the Vampires, here, and the sister series, East Team series, which features East Team Undercover. Um, and this book, right here, the Cassandra Cookbook, it was another one of my more critically acclaimed titles with African American women. Another positive story featuring an African American woman as she tries to, you know, facilitate a business deal between her family's business and a black owned company. So, if I'm producing and publish, and, I'm pu and again, I published all those books myself with my own money. If I publish all of these books myself with my own money, how can I be a misogynist? If I hated black women, why would I continue to publish books for black women with my own money and my own personal savings? Again, if a black man hated a black woman, he would not go out of his way and take his time to publish what is it? One, two, three, four. Oh, I also forgot The Temptation of John Haynes, which also features East Team, another positive image of African American women, another balanced image of African American women. But if I were a misogynist, why would I go out of my way to publish one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and there are five more. I mean, no, eleven. Eleven and five more books featuring African-American women. Again, I presented some of the most positive, balanced images of African-American women in my own work. And again, I spent my own money to present those images of African-American women in my work. That's my fiction work. Those few articles I wrote on my blog, you know, I wrote those to make a constructive criticism of African-American women and the behaviors of African-American women. And the reason why I want to do a constructive criticism of those behaviors is because of, again, what I read and what I saw in American media. What I saw 
in American media talking about on shows like Oprah Winfrey, talking about why 70% of black women are single, on Nightline talking about why black women are single, I wanted to present a counterpoint. And in, in, my, in those vlogs, I presented a counterpoint. Now, some women would say, I am man-hating, but I am not man-hating. I am presenting a constructive discourse, a counterpoint, which is what every man does um, when he's trying to present an argument. And to reinforce my argument, I got things not only from Oprah Winfrey's TV show, not only from other shows like Steve Harvey, not only from shows like Pat Croce and Moving In, not only from, you know, shows like Tyra, but also from your own fiction written by African-American women. And I'm going to go into some of them right now. I'm going to take this book right here called Napoli Ever After. This book was one of the few books, one of the books that I read while, while learning how to become a writer. While I learned how to write my own novels, these are the kind of books that I read from the 90s to the early 2000s. And in this book, Napoli Ever After, we're made to believe that this Venus character, you know, is being done so much wrong and then what when I read the book you think that it's all about natural hair and identity but really it what it really was was about a manipulative dysfunctional woman who thought that she could you know bully and shame some poor guy into marrying her because what happened is she hooked a doctor um, she wanted to speed things up so she what happens is she calls herself shaving off her head and then popping in and thinking that this is going to make this man want to marry her not understanding that her dysfunctional and insane behavior is what drove this man away. Now, that's what I got from reading the book. And what I saw was a woman trying to force a man to marry her. And she thought by shaving her head that she would be cutting away, you know, parts of things. But what she didn't understand was that when you walk in with a shaved head, it's a symbol of distress. If we look at women who are extremely distressed, like Miley Cyrus was many years ago, um, Rihanna was many years ago. When a woman cuts off her hair, it's a sign of distress. But this woman tried to make this sound like, you know, I cut off all my hair as some sort of symbol of pride, you know, some sort of silliness. Um, but what it was, it was showing that she was deeply insecure and deeply troubled. And she, she really wanted things to go her way. And she was basically throwing an adult temper tantrum. And that's what I got from reading this book right here called Napoli Ever After. And again, this was a movie, book that Halle Berry bought the rights to, and she said she wanted to make a movie of. This book, when I read it the first time, I kind of, I didn't miss, I missed a lot of things. But when I read it the second time, that's when all the dysfunction started popping out at me in this book. And this was one of the books that, uh, in addition to the nonfiction research I read, that gave me, you know, some perspective on black women. This book right here, Little Mama's Rules, written by Shineska Jackson, another book that gave me some insight into the dysfunction of black women. Again, written by another black woman. Um, this one features a single, successful, educated career woman who says that she's created all these roles to get herself the man of her dreams. But throughout the book, she winds up breaking all of her own roles. And for most of the book, she spent herself, her time, pining over this dude who she says did her so much wrong. And she sits there and pines over this this shine who did her wrong. Now, he's supposed to be some kind of college-educated, well-educated, intelligent man, but he cheats on her, and she spends half her time pining over this minstrel and telling us that, you know what, I would give him another chance. But you listen to her own dysfunctional narrative, and you understand, you know, why this woman was in the predicament that she's in. She creates all these rules, but then she goes out and breaks all of her rules. This book was pretty much a plotless pile of garbage, um, but it gave me, again, perspective, you know, on many of the dysfunctional ideas many African-American women have. And this is not to bash black women, but many of these books that were written feature some incredibly dysfunctional, uneven narratives that make absolutely no sense. That's not being misogynistic. This is based in your own literature. This is the stuff you guys write and produce. And these are two prime examples of the dysfunction I have seen, you know, right in your own books. And I'm going to go further into this because a lot of people talk about, you know, misogynistic images and, you know, me being a misogynist and hating black women. I don't hate black women. Again, I love black women enough to write almost 15 books 
featuring some of the most positive and balanced images of black women, but when I read your own literature, this is the images and depictions that I get. This is the third book that I read, you know. I was given these books by my sister, um, but this is the third book that I read, The Taming It Down. This book I got back in the 90s, another single, successful, educated black woman who is looking for a man. But what she's really looking for is a white dude. And this author, you know, she's the queen of swirling. She always writes books about some black woman getting with some white dude. And this is what she writes. And this is one supposed to be about some reporter, you know, um, you know, from a New England prep school. And she, she's trying to prove herself to white men and she wants a relationship with white men. This is what this one was about. And this one, again, another one, you know, it follows a similar, same similar narrative. And this is why I can say the things that I say about black women, because I've pretty much read all of your books, because in order for me to become a writer of women's fiction, of, you know, romance novels, and of screenplays, I have to read. And I, these are the, some of the books I have read over the last 25 years to become a professional writer. And this Taming It Down was one of the most, dis this, this, this is one of the most dysfunctional books I have ever read. Um, again, another because all these books they all follow the same narrative. You know, I'm a vic I'm a single, successful, educated black woman. I can't get a man. Everybody's treating me badly. But when you read, but as a professional writer, I have to read between the lines. And when I would read between the lines of these stories, you know, all of the reasons why these women were single would pretty much pop out at me, and they would pretty much, you know, tell the story of why these women are where they are, and. You know, I would sit there, I would read these stories, and again, like a Napoli Ever After. Here we have, I'm going to go back and go pick it up again. Here in Napoli Ever After. Here we have this woman who has a man, has a guy who's in med school. He's trying to, you know, finish his residency. And this woman, you know, is so insecure that she winds up destroying a good thing. What she does is... She wants to force this man to marry her. She wants to force this things to go along. Not understanding that this man, you know, is going through 18, 19 hour days in a residency, you know, and he's trying to finish this up so he can go and pursue his career. She's trying to force him to give her a wedding ring. She's trying to force a commitment. And, you know, they don't look at, a lot of sisters don't look at this stuff. And, you know, see the dysfunctional behaviors that they're participating in that keep them from having, you know, a successful relationship. Maybe this man would have married her if she had waited. She had no patience. She tried to force this man into a relationship. And this is what, this is what I read in this book and this is what I saw. I'm going to shave off all my hair and I'm going to make a demand, ultimatum, that this man either marry me or get out. So the man decides, you know what, I'm just going to leave. And, you know, the book is just completely dysfunctional. This woman sits here and is a victim for, let me see how many, okay, okay, about 200, 280, 290 pages, and everybody is doing her wrong. And this is, again, part of the narrative of your Afro-American woman. Just everybody's doing me wrong. I never take any moment, you know, to take an insight and take a look inside myself and see the stupid decisions that I'm doing and the stupid behaviors I'm participating in. Whenever somebody tries to hold a black woman accountable for anything in real life, they always try to put it on somebody else. And then when somebody like myself tries to present information telling them what they're doing wrong or why, they're, why things aren't going wrong, you're a misogynist, you're, um, you're a misogynist, you're a sexist, and you're not that. You're just presenting information, facts based on what you have observed. And I present facts about black women based on what not only from what I have observed from the research I have done this is not a black woman bash this is just facts that are presented to you you cannot again you cannot force somebody to like you you cannot force somebody to marry you you cannot force things to go the way you want them to go that is not how life works I mean maybe people because they grow up in these single mother households and they're used to seeing their mother being a bully that's the way they think things are supposed to be done but in real life people have choices and they can choose either to be with you or not be with you. But many African-American women never understand this concept. And they think that they can just, you know, bully and shoehorn people into things that they're not supposed to be in. Sadly, many never get the idea that, you know, 
maybe he's just not that into you. That was something that was mentioned in, you know, White Girls, Sex in the City. And they even wrote a book about that. But it's a true fact. Maybe he's just not that into you. And many black women, they instead of listening to this advice, insist on making things go their own way. Now, there are other books that I have read, you know, in the African-American female lexicon. And this is another one, He Say, She Say. This is actually a first edition of this book. Um, got a little beat up under my bed, but... You know, this is another for this is um another one of these black women. I'm single, successful, well educated. Um, I can't get a man. This one, another one of these ones that fits the dysfunctional narrative many African American feel females have. Um, this one, this one was all over the place. Um, it was written by Yolanda Joe. It's just all over the place. Um, I've read books that were tons better, but this one. This one took the cake. I mean, it was all, again, this was directionless and all over the place. And again, it follows the exact same narrative of many of these other single, successful, well-educated black woman dramas. You know, I can't get a man. People aren't treating me right. Um, and this victim narrative is one of the things that many black women just don't understand that turns guys like myself off. I mean, if you really want to alienate somebody, play this victim narrative. I mean, it gets grading over time. I know I've mentioned this in numerous blogs, but it's a fact. It's very, very, very grating. It gets annoying. People just get tired of listening to you complain. You know, this is a problem, that's a problem. And then you don't want to lift the finger towards, you know, any type of constructive solution. Usually when people have a problem, like myself, usually we work towards some type of solution. Nobody wants to just sit there and listen to people complain about problems. Um, but this is, you know, part of the narrative of your average black woman drama. It's not in my books. I don't present that at all. In a book like The Thetas or All About Marilyn here, there is none of that narrative. All these female characters I make are, you know, they're strong heroines who say, look, I have a problem, you know, like Marilyn had, you know, about Marilyn. She wanted to break away from this, um, TV character that was featured here in all about Nikki. She wanted to break away from the character because she was typecast. So she had to go through making some really painful decisions in order to break away from that character. And the way she found that she could break away from the character was to become herself. And she had to learn how to accept who she was and what she wanted out of life. Um, in the Thetas, the character of Colleen wants to be a Theta. She wants to join the sorority um, and in the, in, the, in the process of joining the sorority, she learns and discovers, you know, what makes her great. She thinks that, that the sisterhood is going to turn her into a clone, but the irony is she winds up becoming the person who she wants to be. Um, and that's a major point in that story. And it's one of the most um, critically acclaimed and praised, again, Marilyn and Thetans are critically acclaimed. And they're very popular. Same thing with Temptation of John Haynes. People love this story because the East End character eventually comes to a point where she realizes what she wants in life and she finds strength from within. She doesn't come in with some single successful, I'm so well educated. She has to learn, you know, what makes, what, what the best parts of her are the human parts of her. And this is a fantasy story, but she learns to embrace her humanity and, you know, become, and that's what is a major turning point for her character. Um, and for Nikki's character, she, you know, she learns how to do things differently. But when I present images of African-American women, again, I try to make the most balanced and humanized images of African-American women possible. I don't like presenting, you know, these emotionally unbalanced, you know, victimized stories of African-American women. I can also go over here to Cassandra Lee, another, you know, balanced, humanized image of an African-American woman. And... You know, she's, a, again, a successful baker and a successful businesswoman, and she's trying to, you know, help her family take her business to the next level through having them license their products with this corporation, ITC Foods. Um, but, you know, people will sit there and they will say, you know, I read one blog, this guy's a misogynist. But if you sit there and read, you know, all of my literary works, um, you will see that I present some of the most balanced images of African-American women possible. I mean, even in this book right here, The Thetas, 
I have been told that women were surprised that a man wrote this novel because the depictions of women in it were so balanced. Um, same thing with All About Marilyn back here. Um, many women are surprised that a man could write a story about a woman like this. And the same thing with All About Nikki here. Um, people are surprised that a man could write a woman like this. Um, but, you know, many African-American women will sit there and say I'm a misogynist, and, you know, I'm not a misogynist. Again, if I hated women, why would I write so much about women? Um, but, you know, all because you present a difference of opinion based on, you know, facts you have seen, people will say that you hate women. But these same women, which is crazy, will give a group like NWA a pass. Now, NWA calls women B's and H's and called women B's and H's, you know, for the last 25, 30 years. Your Ice Cubes, your Dr. Dre's, and your other gangster rappers like your Tupac's, your Biggie Smalls, they sit there and they call women B's and H's, B's and H's, B's and H's, and the females will sit there and praise these men. This is, this is, you know, but they won't call these men misogynists. Now, black men have been calling these guys misogynists since the early 1990s, since I remember back then. There were black men coming out and calling these guys misogynists, but black women will let this let these guys, you know, pump on their stereos, let their kids listen to these guys call these women all sorts, call themselves all sorts of names, and they'll sit there and say this, you know, like it's no problem. But a guy telling you why you are single because the approaches you're using in life do not work, he's a misogynist. But this gangster rapper who's been calling you B's and H's, perfectly fine. Same thing with many of these other street lit authors who pre present all sorts of violent behavior in their novels. I mean, these guys call women B's and H's and all sorts of MF's. Um, when books like your, like, I forget, Deja King or whatever her name is, um, the, B, the, the, the book's title is B Word. And the sequels are called B Word 2, B Word 3, B Word 4, um, Life of a Bee. Um, they, they're, they're, you call yourself, this woman's calling, calling, calling her, her title of her book. This is a black woman producing a book with the title of it is the name of a female dog. But, you know, nobody sees what's wrong with that. And many of these other street lit books, I've seen, I've seen one called Silver Platter Ho. I've seen this one go Silver Platter Ho 2, Silver Platter Ho 3, Silver Platter Ho 4. Um, other ones calling them B's, H's, the best H in town, the, the top B, the top H, and these were all written by black women, but they call me a misogynist, and I call you Marilyn, Nikki, and Isis, but I am a misogynist. Right on the front of my covers, Marilyn, Nikki, Isis, Cassandra, and Easting. This is the This is what I call you. I call you by a name. They call you a, a profanity, but I'm a misogynist. Misogynist, again, does not is the guy who calls you out of your name. I have the woman's name right on the front of the cover. What does that say? I mean, people look at the actions. Look at the actions. If you look at my actions, you will see there is no misogyny here. A man who is calling you Colleen, Easton, Marilyn, Nikki, Isis, this one, this is black women calling themselves B, Queen B, H, Silver Platter H. Um, but I'm the guy who's the misogynist. I'm the guy who hates women. You know, you look at this depiction, you look at these images, and you see, you know, who is the real misogynist. And I'll go even further and show you more misogyny that, you know, you can't see between the lines. Um, let's look at your Steve Harvey. Um, a lot of people call, look at this black, a lot of black women look at this man as some sort of hero. They look at him as some sort of relationship guru. Um, but if you look at his book, you know, Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man, how is this Christian man presenting, you know, this idea to women? I mean, if you look at your Bible, you will see where he went wrong. I mean, right in the title. How can you think like a man? Um... God never made the man to be, you know, made the woman to think like a man. He made the woman, again, to think like a woman. And you cannot get any insight into thinking like a man. What this guy does 
is he's a misogynist in that he tells women, you know, the lie that they can think like a man and learn to be, you know, like a man and get into a man's head. I mean, I've read Steve Harvey's Act Like a Lady, Think Like a Man. And I'll just say it was one of the most ridiculous things I have ever read. It was downright comical. Um, and especially what really irritated me is that he comes from this so-called Christian perspective. Now, as a, Christ, as a man who's been a Christian for 25 years, or who tries to be a Christian as best as he possibly can, because, you know, none of us can really, you know, without Jesus putting his spirit in you, can do this. Um, I know for a fact that a lot of what he presents is wrong. Now, you can go back to your Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and you can see the start of where Steve Harvey went wrong. Now, he says, And then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Now, that's the role of the woman that God defined. But, you know, Steve Harvey's going to tell you, you can think like a man. And we're going to go over, you know, to your Corinthians chapter 11. Um... Here we go, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But, as, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head, head of Christ is God. I'll say that again. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's the natural order which is God, Jesus, man, woman. But, you know, most people would look at that and, you know, they wouldn't understand it. They don't understand that simple concept. That's why I can say that Steve Harvey is a, you know, a joker, because he sits there and says, you can think like a man when God never made, you, made a woman to think like a man. He never made that to be possible. And he can never give you any insight into it, because you don't understand that what it is. Men are made to be logical, they are made to analyze and think because they have to think about the long-term needs of the household. The woman is made to be emotional because it's her job to think of the short-term needs of the household. And they're both supposed to work together, you know, to take care of the needs of the household and take care of the needs of the family. But, you know, many black women will call that sexist and misogynistic because they have bought into these false concepts of a white Jesus and white feminism. The white feminist concept tells you that you don't need a man. But when I can go right back to my Bible in Genesis chapter 2, you know, and say, it is good that the man should not be alone, I, sh I, I will make and help me for him. Plain and simple. Right there. Irrefutable fact. But he's going to tell you, you don't need a man. And then you read these codependent, dysfunctional, you know, books like these, where the woman spends half her time trying to say that I need a man. But then you say you don't need a man, you know. But the guy is a misogynist for presenting you, you know, with facts that state, you know, this is why you are single, because you follow these dysfunctional ideologies presented to you by white liberal politicians, white feminists, Madison Avenue advertisers, Hollywood movie studios, that tell you that this is black womanhood. And, you know, you don't understand that this is all fake. It's all made up. It's made to keep you dysfunctional so that you can continue to medicate yourself with products. And, you know, this is what they do. This is what the, this is what is done. And, you know, a guy who's trying to tell you, you know, these approaches do not work and that you will always remain single for the rest of your life if you continue to follow these approaches and continue to imbibe this dysfunctional media, that guy's a misogynist. Now, a misogynist, again, hates women. And you can see the hatred for women that many men, such as your... Two Alive Crew has, your Tupac Shakur has, your Biggie Smalls has, your Ice Cube has. You can see it in many of these gangster rappers, many of these NBA ball players, many of these dysfunctional males out here, these pookies, these ray rays. You can see it, you know, through their not only their actions, but their words, and more important, most importantly, their actions. If these men truly love these women, you know, and many of them loved you, he would have gone out and married you from the first moment. But, you know, a lot of people think they have this mental mentality that think that they can shoehorn a guy into a relationship where he doesn't want to be. They don't understand, you know, that this man never really liked you. He was just playing with you, you know. But a lot of you try to tell black women this, they don't want to hear it. They want to call you a misogynist and a sexist 
you know, for presenting opinions that they disagree with and presenting points that they disagree with. And you're just sitting there, you know, writing blogs, you know, trying to help black women because what's sad is I present different information for black men because I also write about men's issues. Those men pick those blogs up. They pick up books like the Simp Trilogy, like um, Stop Simping, Manginas, Misadventures of Captain Saberhold. They pick those books up. They learn from them, and they take themselves to the next level. Many black women instead get angry, get bitter, you know, and start using shaming tactics and bullying to try to dismiss the information I present or to try to shut the debate down. Instead of saying, look, maybe there's some information here that I can use you know, to take my life to the next level. Maybe this person isn't trying to hurt my feelings. Maybe they're trying to help me move ahead. Maybe I need to hear this so that I can move my life forward. Because instead of me, you know, keep hitting my head against the window and participating in a vicious cycle, I can actually take my life and move it forward. And that's something I had to do in my own personal life um, way back in the, late in, the late, in the early 1990s when I saw myself not being able to get out of high school. That was one of the things I had to do. It was a painful thing for me to do, but I had to do it. And I had to take that long, hard look inside myself and say, look, this isn't working. It's time for me to try a different approach. And this is one of the reasons why I write, you know, blogs like why 70% of black women are single, or I even write ebooks like why 70% of black women are single. I want to see black women move forward. I want to see black women, you know, move their lives ahead. And, you know, I want to see them take their lives to the next level. I want to see them break free of these vicious cycles where they continue to make the same mistakes over and over with different people. Because I look at th things in, uh, with many different, not just, not just um, things like I've seen in Nightline or things that I've seen even in these dysfunctional literature. Uh, I look at even my own family, because I've even gotten criticized and attacked by my own family for presenting these blogs and these books, um, like why 70% of black women are single. But I present those, again, because I care so much about black women. I love black women, and I want to see, again, I want to see them take their lives to the next level. I, look, I read stories about women like your Halle Berry's or your, um, what is it, Tanya Pinkins, and it really saddens me to see these women, you know, fall apart. I mean, Halle Berry was on, is on, she's failed, had three failed marriages, Tanya Pinkins had two failed marriages, and you don't really, you know, it really saddens me to see this, you know regarding black women, that they continue to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And they continue to not take a look at the doctrines they've learned and imbibed, the media they've imbibed, and really come to understand that, you know what, many of those approaches just don't work. And many of the things you have even listened to from your pastor in the misinterpretation of your Bible do not work. Because your pastor, your Negro pastor, has totally misinterpreted this book. And you know, he is not helping you get that close relationship to God that you really should have. And I look at the, his interpretation, and it's completely dysfunctional, and it's completely outside the order of God. Because if you look at the God's natural order, you know, he has, he, want, he wants us all to, you know, follow his lead. But, you know, when in the, in the model that many African American women are following, they think that they're the leader. They're following the lead of what I call the white Jesus, which is really white liberal politicians white and, and white males, you know, white liberal males, and trying to maintain a matriarchal order that is man-made and not trying to be part of the order that God has established for families. This is why their families, the black family, is completely dysfunctional and completely out of order because it follows an order that is completely broken and completely outside of God's natural order. God's natural order, you know, everybody who follows that order what consciously or unconsciously winds up with success, but the black family, as we see, the only one that does not follow that order, that tries to follow a matriarchal man-made order where the female is the leader and the man is at the bottom of the hierarchy, that's the only one that's broken. That's the only one that does not work. But again, people will listen to the things that I say and say, oh, he's a misogynist, oh, he's a sexist. Again, and if you look at my body of work, if you look at the comprehensive body of work I have produced, besides the articles I have written in my blogs. Um, again, you will see a man who loves women, because again, this is my mission, to present positive images of the African American experience, to diversify the African American book market, and to present those positive images of African American women. 
because I understand that as the woman goes, so goes the race. If I continue to present, if we continue to present images of African American women acting like savages in the street, fighting each other in the street like wild animals, um, women twerking in stores, women putting their putting lingerie pictures of themselves on Facebook, what does that say about the direction that our race is going? If our woman is teaching this culture to her children, what kind of culture are we teaching to our children? Moreover, if we have a culture um, that teaches our males that sitting in the house all day while your woman works, um, going outside at 6 o'clock in the morning to go stand outside of a foreign-owned store or a foreign-owned chicken place and beg for change, what type of model is that woman teaching her, her children? What type of model is that teaching for manhood? What type of model is she teaching her son about manhood? That, you know, I go to work, you beg for change. What does that say? I mean, we're not taking, you know, that long, hard examination of the behaviors that we are teaching to our children and that are being modeled for our children. Because, again, if your black woman is the teacher of culture, what type of culture are we teaching to our women, to our children? What type of culture are we teaching? Woman goes to work, man just is a bum. Woman goes to work, man is a bum. Man just sits there, you know, he takes whatever scraps and trimmings from the table. No other family works like this. No other family has, you know, our adult males sitting up like a pet dog in the background, you know, or, or a handicapped child, you know, in the back. If you look at white culture, Asian culture, Hispanic culture, um, Indian culture, even African culture, we don't see that type of family structure. We only see that type of family structure with your African American. We only see that, you know, with, mo with many, and the sad part is 70% of African American families are just like this. The woman goes to work, the woman is the head of the family, and this man, you know, is presented in the background as weak. And we have the woman degrading her own image because she pretty much shows through her actions that she doesn't like herself. But, you know, she'll call me a misogynist and say that I hate women. But when, how can I hate women again when I produce books that present some of the most humanized images of black women possible? But she, co she goes out and buys books that call herself a B, call herself an H, call herself a Queen B, call herself a Queen H. Um, that books that feature her with her backside facing, facing the front on the front cover. Books that feature, you know, her being draped in lingerie. Books that feature her, you know, um, being just all sorts of, you know, because I've looked at this African American fiction market, you know, I've seen all sorts of images, stuff that is borderline pornographic. Now, I know the All About Maryland cover features a nude, but this is an artistic nude, and the point of it was, you know, to get you to look at the face, because I understand how art works, and the point of it was to get you to look at the red lips and look up at the face, because that's what I learned what artistic nudes were all about, whereas porn is about, you know, sexualizing the body. But if you look at all of my covers, many of them, you see, even in this ISIS All About the Goddess, same thing, the art is meant to draw you to the face. That's what it was meant to do. Because that's what art is. But if you look at my images of African American women, they, again, they're, you see a black woman on the front. You see, again, black woman's face on the front. Black women's faces on the front. Black woman's face on the front. Black woman's face on the front. A black woman's face on the front. A black woman's face on the front. And you see, again, varying skin tones, varying textures. So people coming to me with things like your color struck, again, these shaming tactics, they don't work because how can I be color struck when I put varying shades of African Americans on there? How can I be, you know, misogynistic when I put a woman's face on the front cover? How can I be a misogynist when I present images that are some of the most, as I believe, again, balanced, balanced images you know, of African American women um, on my covers. Now, how can I be that a misogynist? Again, if a man hated black women, he would not present these type of images. He would not, you know, again, come out of his own pocket, even being unemployed for seven straight years, 
coming out of his own pocket to continue to produce this type of work. I mean, I love black women this much that I would actually, you know, come out of my own pocket, sell parts of my own personal toy collection on eBay to make better covers to serve and, you know, sell books to African American women. But I'm called the misogynist based on one blog or two blogs that you that many says some black women disagree with. And what is there to disagree with? I mean, it's my opinion. That's what a blog is. It's somebody's opinion. It is not a journal article. It is not a news article. Now, some do people with doctorates have taken my blogs and used them. Some people with bachelor's degrees have used it in their research. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't like the opinion, then that's on you. I, I don't, there are blogs that I, that I disagree with. I just hit the red X and leave. And, you know, misogyny is something that is it's just a word a lot of people like to throw around, but they don't really understand what it means. If they understood what it means, they would, you know, take a real hard look at their, at the other side of the spectrum again, and look at the other bodies of work. If you look at the bodies of work of your Ice Cubes, your NWAs, your Snoop Dogs, again, your Steve Harveys, your Tyler Perrys, your Lee Daniels, these men, people pr clearly participate in misogyny but many African-American women give them a pass. Same thing with your feminists like your Alice Walker, um, again, and your Oprah Winfrey. If these, if these women love black women, why would they go out of their way to present a black woman as a victim? I, in all my works, try to show the internal strength of character black women have, the courage that black women have on the inside, the resolve that black women have on the inside. Again, if I, I love black women enough that I try to present that balanced image. And even in my blogs, I may sound harsh, but that's something I learned from the Strive Job Readiness Program. And in that program, we had to deal with a lot of super dysfunctional people. We had to deal with homeless people. We had to deal with ex-convicts. We had to deal with ex-offenders. Um, and we had to shake them up and get them right. And those people went through pain. And I'll tell you, they went in the year that I worked there as part of the AmeriCorps program, I saw people going through pain, homeless people going through pain, unemployed, I mean, single mothers going through pain. Um, and these people, at the, end of the, at the end of three weeks, a lot of those people grew because they were able to take that constructive criticism. They were able to take that harsh critique of themselves and take that hard look that other people had seen and say to themselves, you know what, if three or four people are saying this about me and this is why I'm not being able to keep jobs, then maybe I'm doing something wrong. And those men and women who went through that program got their lives together, and, they be, and, they, and a lot of them got jobs after that, and a lot of them kept jobs after that. And the reason why they were able to do that is because they were able to listen to a harsh critique and, you know, take what, they, what was heard to them and listen to it. Now, I have listened to people, but, you know... When you call someone a misogynist and you don't understand, you know, what this person is trying to do because you just read on the surface of the letters, not between the lines, that shows me, you know, that there's a, there's a lot of these sisters need to have a lot of growing. And the sad part is, you know, a lot of them are being, they're, they're being prevented from growing by simps like your Steve Harvey and, you know, and your Tyler Perry's and your Lee Daniels, these enablers who continue to make excuses for black women and continue to, you know, tell black women what they want to hear. But these men don't want to see black women grow. They don't want to see them take themselves to the next level. I, on the other hand, I want to see you take yourself to the next level, whether you buy my books or not. If you can learn something and, and that helps you to move forward, I feel that you have done something with your life. I mean, part of growing is understanding that, you know, I'm at a point where I'm going nowhere and I need to take, you know, action to move myself forward. And we all have to do that in our lives. We eventually, many cases, we run into points in life where what we're doing just doesn't work anymore and we have to move forward. And many African American people just don't, women especially, don't understand this. They want to have everything stay the same way. They don't want their boys to grow up. They don't want their families, they don't want their husbands to change. But change is a part of life and oftentimes change comes in ways that we don't expect or we don't like and I've had to deal with change ever since I was you know seven years old and I had a brain aneurysm operation it was a very painful thing for me 
um, you know, dealing with social stigmas and stuff like that. And I finally have come to accept that part of my life. I had to accept, you know, what happened to me many years ago on a train in 1989. And I had to use all that, you know, to move myself forward. And I'm still trying to make changes in my life. But your African-American woman wants to stay in the same place, stay the same way, not understanding that she's falling deeper and deeper into a cycle of codependency. And, you know, where she remains the victim or in a state of perpetual victimhood that is just a race to the bottom. And when you hit the bottom, it's not a, it's not a pretty sight. Because to sit there and say that, you know, a guy is a misogynist because he presents a difference of opinion, you know, shows that you're just, that a lot of people, they're just not ready for differing opinions. I mean, the person is going to present a point to you, and if you don't like hearing the point, then that's just, that's on you. But the information I presented in those blogs, again, is because I care deeply about black women and I want to see black women grow. It's not because I hate black women. A person who hates black women is like your enablers, like your Lee Daniels, your Tyler Perry's, and your Steve Harvey's. Or your straight-up man, hate, woman, woman haters like your NWAs, your Ice Cubes, your Dr. Dre's, your Snoop Dogs, your Jay Z's, um, many of these gangster rappers. These guys pretty much express their contempt for black women in every lyric that they use or every verse that they say. And even some black women, like your Oprah Winfrey's and your Alice Walker, show their contempt for black women because they want to pimp and exploit you. Same thing with your Negro pastor, another man who expresses his contempt for black women because he won't take this word of God, this, God's own word, and use it, to preach it to you properly. He won't tell you about the role of a woman. He won't tell you about, you know, how it relates to the family and the forming of a strong family. This Negro pastor won't take the word of God and teach it pro properly um, to anyone. All he talks about is prosperity and blessings when that's not what the word of God is about at all. And if these men loved you, he, they would tell you like I tell you. If these men loved you, they would present their points the way I present the points. Now, that may hurt a lot of people, but that's just the way I do things. Um, and it may offend some people, but that's the way I do things. And you know what? Again, a man who loves you is the one who tells you the truth, not this smooth operator that, you know, you see who tells you everything you want to hear. You're never offended by him. He's always trying to smooth things over. That's not a man. A man is a man who has the character, the backbone, to come to you and tell you what you need to know so you can move your life forward. He's the man who's going to tell you what you need to know so you can do what you need to do. That's what a man is, a man of character, a man of integrity. He is going to say what needs to be said, whether you like hearing it or whether or not you like hearing it. He's going to say what needs to be said. And it may hurt your feelings, but I'd rather it hurt your feelings for a minute than tell you something, tell you a lie that hurts you for a lifetime. Again, um, that's the way a man does. But a lot of women have never experienced men. They have never experienced men of character, men of integrity, men of honor. They have not experienced that type of man. All you've experienced throughout your life are simps, players, manginas, all sorts of, you know, weak, effeminate, soft men who do not have the backbone to stand up to you. And these are the type of men, because they don't, they can't stand up to you, I'll tell you something else. They won't stand for it. They won't stand with you. Because they won't stand up to you, they won't stand with you. This is why these cowards run away at every possible chance they get whenever you say something like, I'm pregnant. Or, you know, it's time for anything anything serious. This is the guy who runs away because he's a coward. But this is the type of man many black women think is a good man. This is what Madison Avenue and Hollywood have told you is a good man. But this is not a man of God. This is not a man of character. And this is not what manhood is all about. I'm here. You may not like what I have to write in my blogs. You may not have to like, have to like, like what I write in my books. But I'm going to present a positive example of manhood and what manhood represents. That's all I have to say for this video. You can pick up many of my books such as the Thetas, Thetas, All About Marilyn, All About Nikki, Temptation of John Haynes, Isis, and the Isis series books and the Cassandra Cookbook and East Team Undercover on Amazon.com. Just click the link in the description box. I present positive images of black women in all my work and I make every effort to present the best image of African-American women possible because I know the African-American woman is the teacher of culture and as she goes, so goes the race. 
And I want to make every effort to uplift the African-American woman and take her to the next level. I want her to be the best woman she can possibly be. That's why I present all the positive role models that I do in my books. Again, that's all I have to say for this video. You can thank, comment, rate, and subscribe.